You probably don't know each one by name, but this group's decisions affect your daily life. Let our powers combine. The combined power of the Supreme Court's nine justices is equal to... I am Captain Planet. Planet. Captain who? No, I was gonna say both the Congress and the President of the United States. Whether you know who they are or not, you're able to walk up to each one right now and say, for me, you work. <laughs> Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution states, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. But what does that actually mean? Look at it this way. If Congress is the chief creator of the law, and the president is the chief enforcer of the law, then the Supreme Court is the chief interpreter of the law. Our main job is to try to make sure federal law is uniform across the country. Are you still lost? Hmm? Well, basically what the Supreme Court does is figure out if a current law created on Capitol Hill is constitutional. In other words, is it legal for that law to exist. Right now the court's made up of nine people, but that hasn't always been the case. At first there were six, and at one point there was ten. The numbers bounced around a bit over the past 200 years. But either way, right now there is one chief and eight associate justices, and even though they've got different titles, other than having the best seat in the room, when it comes down to it, the chief has pretty much the exact same amount of power as each of the associates. Now since this group has so much responsibility, so much influence over the American way of life, there surely must be a long list of requirements for obtaining the job. You probably have to graduate from the law program at an Ivy League school? Well, surely you have to at least have a bachelor's degree. How about graduating from high school? Is that a requirement? It may sound crazy, but it's actually the case. Holding a position on the Supreme Court only has two constitutional requirements. First, the President of the United States has to pick you, and then the Senate has to approve you. Now, it is true. These days, you probably won't get confirmed if you don't have some sort of extensive background in law. But that wasn't always the case. Back in 1941, President Roosevelt nominated this guy, James F. Burns. He was a high school dropout who made it all the way to the nation's highest court. Anyway, back to the requirements. Even though there aren't many of them, that doesn't mean the process of taking a seat on the Supreme Court is easy. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life. I think it's time to be fair to the nominee. During the confirmation process on Capitol Hill, expect senators to question your opinion on all sorts of different issues. You went forward and did this act which the court declared to determined to be an illegal act. Isn't that pretty hard for the American people to accept? I want to ask you if it is fair to say that you believe that privacy is protected into the, under the Constitution. Abortion, civil rights, gun control, nothing's off the table. We're talking about fundamental rights that women for too, too long have not been provided. And while all that's going on, the FBI is searching for skeletons in your closet. Uh, was there ever a time when you drank so much that you couldn't remember what happened? They'll personally interview everyone from your childhood friends to your current neighbors. Now, if everything checks out and you get enough senators to vote for you, you'll be sworn in. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Unlike the president, who only takes one oath upon taking office, you'll take two. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Swearing to not only uphold the Constitution, but also to remain impartial while serving on the nation's highest court. That I will administer justice without respect to persons. Congratulations and welcome to the court. There are three basic elements to what a Supreme Court justice does. Choosing, listening, and deciding. We'll start with choosing. Most people think they have a right to come to the court. For the most part, you don't. Associate Justice Clarence Thomas there, and he's right, because the Supreme Court in most cases has discretionary jurisdiction. That means the justices get to choose which cases they'll hear. Hmm. About eight to 10,000 petitions come to the Supreme Court each year. The justices review all of them individually. Then they vote on whether or not they'll hear the case. If at least four members vote yes, then the case gets added to the calendar. All in all, they only choose to hear arguments on about 1% of those cases. <laughs> So that means audience members on The Price is Right have a better chance of being told to Come on down! than most court cases have of ever making it to the Supreme Court. Now that they've narrowed down which cases they're going to hear, it's time to do some listening. Starting in October and running through April, it's oral arguments time of the year. Forgive me, I can't sing. Anyway, inside the courtroom, there's a big clock hanging from the ceiling. The second it strikes 10 a.m., the Chief Justice is the first to walk out, followed by the rest of the Associate Justices. But before that happens, the Court Martial yells out, Oh yay, oh yay, oh 
yay. And no, they're not saying, oh yay, the justices are coming. Oh yay is a word used to announce the start of a court proceeding. It originated in Great Britain and is still used to this day, both here and across the pond. The marshal goes on. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. God save the United States and this honorable court. Now, once everyone's seated, both sides get exactly 30 minutes, not a second more, to present their case. In fact, there are even lights in the podium. The white one turns on when you've got five minutes left. And when you see the red one light up, well, that means it's time to shut up. You know, this job is really starting to sound like a competitive reality TV show. Your 30 minutes starts now. Work, work, work. Make it work. And 30 minutes may not seem like a very long time to argue. Turns out a lot can happen in those 30 minutes. I mean, a lot of these cases are very close and you, and you go in on the knife's edge. Persuasive counsel can make the difference. Remember, most of these cases have already been argued in lower court. The justices have access to all the information that was shared during those proceedings, and they probably already reviewed most of it before the first lawyer opens their mouth. At lunchtime, the chief justice will call the court into recess. They all file out of the courtroom, and apparently they enjoy spending their break together. We have lunch all the time together. Um, and occasionally we play two cards together. So, wow. uh, you know, yes, we do hang out. According to the New York Times, former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor enjoyed beef jerky, whereas retired Justice David H. Souter was a plain yogurt kind of guy. Current Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg thinks plain yogurt is gross. Ew. Muffins are her favorite snack. While John Paul Stevens was an associate justice, he had a hankering for cheese sandwiches with the crust cut off. And current Chief Justice John Roberts usually buys a salad from the court's cafeteria. First rate investigative journalism from the New York Times right there. <laughs> the second half of the day is comprised of more of the same. And that about wraps up the bulk of the listening the justices do. Now on to the duty the entire position is built on. Deciding. As I mentioned before, the Supreme Court operates on a yearly calendar that starts in October. They listen to arguments through April, and while they can issue a decision during that time, they mostly wait until all or most of the arguments in each case have been made. That means May and June are opinion months. The justices vote on each case behind closed doors in this conference room. No one can enter the room who is not a justice, no secretary, no law clerk, not even a message bearer. After all the decisions have been made, the Chief Justice assigns each case to an associate justice to write up an opinion. There are four different types of opinions. Majority, concurring, dissenting, and per curiam. A majority opinion is written by a justice who ruled with the majority. They write a lengthy statement on the line of thought that led to their decision. Sometimes these are paired with a concurring opinion. That's written by a justice who voted with the majority, but for a completely different reason than the one already stated. The duty of writing up a dissenting opinion is given to a justice who ruled against the majority. These are important because they provide insight for future cases. There have been many examples of the dissenting opinion eventually becoming the majority years later. An example of this would be the Pace versus Alabama case way back in 1883. Tony Pace and Mary Cox, they challenged an Alabama law against interracial marriage. Back then it was considered a crime, punishable by two to seven years in prison. The Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional. The justices found the law to be, quote, race neutral. Fast forward 48 years. This couple, Mildred and Richard Loving, they took their case to the Supreme Court, and this time the justices agreed that the law was unconstitutional. It wasn't until 1967 that the law was overturned. The final and least common of the four types of decisions is per curiam. That's when an unnamed justice writes an opinion for the entire court. It's usually only used when the court agrees unanimously on a specific case. Now, needless to say, getting nine people to agree on anything, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. Okay, so if the Supreme Court session kicks off in October and wraps up in June, then what do they do during July, August, and September? That's the time they take off each year to recuperate from all the hard work they've done for nine months. Actually, that's not completely true. Justices are never off duty. They use this time to review potential new cases for the next term. Also, the country is split into 13 geographic parts. Each one of these parts operates its own federal circuit court. The justices are each assigned to at least one of these circuits to deal with emergency situations. Case in point, death row inmate Billy Ray Eyrick. He was convicted of raping a child in 1985. It happened in a city just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. In less than 21 hours, Tennessee is set to execute its first death row inmate in nearly a decade. Eyrick's attorney filed a last minute stay of execution request just hours before he was supposed to be put to death. Since it happened in the Sixth Circuit, Associate Justice Elena Kagan had the final say on if his execution would be delayed. She had the authority to rule on this by herself, but decided instead to bring it 
it to the rest of the justices for a vote. They ultimately decided against any delay, and Eirich was executed in August of 2018. So there you have it, a year in the life of a Supreme Court justice. They get used to the schedule because once you become a justice, you stay a justice. It's a lifetime appointment, which means you can stay on the job until the day you die if you want. But you do have to be on your best behavior because that's what the Constitution says, that the judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Of course, even if you do misbehave, it's still pretty difficult for you to get fired. In fact, it's never happened before. You've got to be impeached just like the president. That means two-thirds of both the House and the Senate have to vote in favor of giving you the axe. The closest this ever came to happening was way back in 1805 when this guy, Associate Justice Samuel Chase, he was impeached by the House but then the Senate acquitted him. So he got to keep his seat and stay on the federal government's payroll. Oh, and speaking of pay... Each year, the associate justices make a little more than $255,000. The chief justice makes $267,000 a year. But that's just the money they get from the federal government. With book deals and teaching gigs, most justices work outside jobs that can rake in some serious cash. According to the Center for Public Integrity, at least six and possibly all nine of the current justices are millionaires. Associate Justice Stephen Breyer is the richest with a net worth of more than $6 million. Chief Justice Roberts is right behind him at $5 million. And Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg rounds out the top three. She's worth about $4 million. So as you can see, holding a position on the highest court in the land, well, it pays off in more ways than one. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out last week's where I go over all the responsibilities and duties the President of the United States has to come through on every day. Please, please, please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Every week we'll highlight a new person or a group of people you can walk up to and say, for me, you work.